Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon, and look who's pulling double duty today. I'm Frank Isola. If you like me on Around the Horn, you're going to love me on PTI. Or maybe you'll throw a brick to your television. Whatever. Something. You're taking over the network. You're doing Sports Center after that? Huh? Only if you do it with me. No. Partners in crime. No. I'm going away. I mean, I'm already away. Vacation? So I'm going somewhere. It's a vacation. Welcome to PTI. Tony abandoned you people, so here to pick up the slack is our great friend, Mr. Frank Isola. Oh, I thought they were going to throw things. All right, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's throwing anything at you. We begin with last night's Hall of Fame game and the NFL's rollout of its new allegedly safer kickoff format. The Bears and Texans combined for eight kickoffs in a rain-shortened game. And while the longest return only made it to the 31, there was just one touchback, whereas touchbacks happened 73% of kicks last yeah. season. Frank, your initial review of what passes today for NFL kickoffs is what? <laughs> you know what? I actually liked it. I think it has a lot of potential. When I first watched it, does it look a little gimmicky? Does it look like a new Olympic event, maybe a combination of football and rugby seven? But I think it's a smart thing, and I think the players talked about it after the game. The Bears wide receiver Tyler Scott said, you could tell that it does protect the players a little bit, which is one part of it. But I think you're also adding in, we want kickoff returns. Because you get all hyped up before a game, and there's nothing worse than when the kicker is basically kicking the ball through the uprights into the stands, and next thing you know, the teams are trotting off the field, and 22 more players are coming on. So I like the idea. There'll be some gimmicks, because remember this, Mike, the kicker has to kick the ball within the 20-yard line. If it's kicked in front yeah. of the 20, if it hits the ground, they spot it at the 40. So there's some skill involved, and you know this as well. It was a preseason game, so maybe some of these coaches have tricks up their sleeve. They're not going to use them, them in the Hall of Fame game in August. No, no. Frank, there's so many things to tick off here. For one, it's great irony that Devin Hester went into yeah. the Hall of Fame last night, the greatest kick return man ever, uh, and for the Bears, of course. And, you know, I, I want to like it, Frank. I, I, I look at it and I think, okay, I, first of all, I thought what, what you thought, and I think Ryan Clark pointed this out um, before or the game or during the storm delay, that yeah. no, coaches aren't going to put their best stuff out there right now. But yeah. what I also think is this. The way people are aligned, maybe there's some tweaks to be made. Maybe you can move them five yards away from each other. Maybe you get running backs in a new position. Tyler Scott, who's a Bears receiver mostly, he can carry the ball occasionally. Yeah. You know, he, I hope he likes it because he may be on that duty with a full wide receiver room yeah. in Chicago. But maybe you get running backs. Maybe you get sweeps. Maybe you get, you know, student body left or right like yeah. Marcus Allen used to run for USC. Maybe instead of breaking it all the time, you can pick up 25, 30 yards and give yourself good field position and you get the odd great player who returns them all the way. Maybe their tweaks, Frank, I want to like it. I need to see a little more play with it right now, a little more give and take. Don't tell me it's only about safety because the NFL owners in the league don't give a damn about safety because they're trying to add an 18th game 18th and they'll try game. to get to 20 and take it to Easter. So I don't want to hear that garbage. But well, you brought I want to you... like it. Let's play with it. Well, you brought up the stats. 73% of the uh, kickoffs last year went for touchbacks. That was the most in the league since 1970. That's a long time. So on the one well, you hand, can you can also want move the them back. And it's if you just wanted I, that, Frank, you can move the kickers back to the 10. You can yeah. eliminate touchbacks by simply moving the kickoff back. So they're lying there, too. I mean, let's get to the truth here about the yeah. NFL doesn't really want to deal with. You can, you can eliminate touchbacks. But that's not you, what they want. They want to appear as if they're addressing safety. Did you have a problem last night with Caleb Williams not playing? Can we, can we get the guy in no, there for I one set it. of downs? Am I asking I too much? I liked it. You didn't have any starters on either side. No. Caleb Williams has had nine practice days, Frank. It's okay oh. to let him have 18. He'll have 18 before the next game. Let them work it. People used to sit. Aaron <laughs> Rodgers sat for three years. Caleb Williams can't sit for nine days? Come he's on the, now. He's the number one overall pick. Why are you telling so me to buy a what? ticket for the game if I'm not going to so see the number what? one overall pick? Then don't buy the damn ticket. As a coach, that's not my concern. Stay home. One, one series. All right, we got more from Chicago. Stay home. Where, guess what? The White Good. Sox, they couldn't lose what? last night. 
That's because they didn't play. But they're back on the field tonight in Minnesota where they could lose, get ready for it, their 18th game in a row. The modern record for most consecutive losses is 23, and the fewest wins in a season is 40. With both records within reach, Mike, do you find tracking the White Sox utility to be compelling? No. And this is very personal for me. It's not a professional decision. Um, everybody who, anybody who's watched this show over any period of time knows I'm a Cub fan. That's what my loyalties yep. are. But I grew up on the south side of Chicago with a father who's a White Sox fan. And I went to that ballpark more than anywhere uh, my whole life. I didn't go to Bears games and Blackhawks games. I, I went to White Sox games first and foremost. And Michael Reinsdorf, who's the son of the principal owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, is a personal friend and has been for a while. And I don't, so this is personal for me. And I'm not going to get joy out of it. I don't want to track it. I really don't even want to acknowledge it. It's awful. I have said since like the second week of the season, this is the worst baseball team, Major League Baseball team, Frank, I've ever seen. And they're just a couple of years removed from having so many good prospects that responsible people who, who follow Major League Baseball every day had the White Sox going deep into the playoffs. Just a couple of years ago, they hired yeah. Tony La Russa. They were going to make a run in, in, in Jerry Reinsdorf's senior years. And I, I'm a Cub fan, but I cheered this. I don't hate the White Sox. I, I, don't, I don't ever root against the White Sox. But this is, Frank, they're the worst ever, ever. Yeah, well, they, ha- they have a chance to eclipse the 62 Mets, which is, you know, that's the standard for futility. That's ever. You know, my, yeah. my first, one of my first beats, I covered a Met team that lost over 100 games. And when you get to this point in the season, when it's August, especially in an Olympic year, but you have football starting up, college football, and Ugh. that's really the only thing going. Everyone wondering if you're going to get to 100 losses, or in this case, maybe 121, 122, or 123 for the White Sox. And remember this, too, about the players. These guys have worked hard to get to this point, and it becomes embarrassing. And think of the people that work in that organization when this is what you're going to be known for. But guess what, Mike? It's going to be yes. a story. What's going to keep the Whites? And I look know. how they've done against the Minnesota Twins. The Twins are 9-1 and one against them this year. Their schedule is the swept. 15th toughest schedule remaining in baseball. And with the trades that they made, there's a very good chance they're going to get to this record, if you can believe it. Frank, I know it is. Look, I, I, you know, I'm out here in Arizona where I, where I spend a lot of time, live part of the time, and the White Sox have a great presence because their spring training site is here. Yep. And so there are people like Jermaine Dye and Paul Canerico who've been neighbors who were attached to great, a great White Sox team, one and won a championship. Kenny Williams, yeah. a, a dear friend. So, so no, I, I'm not reveling in any White Sox misery. And again, to, to Michael Reinsdorf, I saw him recently. We, we, we sat and chatted about everything in the world you can talk about except the White Sox. Tracking, not me. <laughs> Just not doing it. Yeah. And now to Mike Trout's future. The Angels have shut down their star center fielder for the rest of the season following a second meniscus tear in his left knee. Trout has missed big chunks of the past four seasons. But Angels GM, Perry, and I'm going to probably get this wrong, Manazian, maybe it's Manazian, you say Manazian, I say Manazian, (laughs) said, quote, no one cares more than he does. He's going to come back, he's going to win the MVP, and he's going to hit 70 home runs. Book it. Close quote. Please stop. How do you feel, Frank, about Manazian's prediction? Yeah, I'm not going to take a stab at that name either, but he seems like he's trying to talk this into existence. You mentioned a big chunk. With the 133 games that Trout is going to miss this season, it's 359 over the last four years. And you start thinking about great players over the last 30, 40 years who might have had great careers sidetracked to injury. I think of two guys here in New York. One was Don Mattingly, one was Johan Santano, came from Minnesota to the Mets. And you think of these great, great players. Trout's in a different category. Yeah. Because this guy, you know, his first seven or eight years in the league, he was finishing top two in the MVP voting. But injuries have become a big part of it. Here's what he has on his side, though. On Wednesday, he's going to turn 33. So in theory, he's still young enough. I wonder, though, Mike, you tell me. He's got six years left on the contract. You're the angel. you got nothing right. for Otani. You're not getting anything out of Mike Trout. Would you consider trading him? I know a bunch of teams on the East. He's from Vineland, New Jersey. I bet you the Phillies might be interested. Maybe at this point, the best thing for both him and the team might be to move on at some point, as, a, as opposed to thinking he's going to hit 70 home runs next year. Frank, I, first of all, I, when I heard that, I, I just, you know, I just shuddered 
because you, he's trying to maybe prop his guy up and make him feel better after meeting or talking with him. And you just want to say, shh, don't, don't, don't do this. Don't say that. You're putting yeah. now weight on him when that's the last thing he needs. A couple of things. I hear meniscus, and when you're a Chicago boy like me, you think about Derrick Rose, who won yeah. an MVP. Didn't finish just second or third, won it. And, and, and meniscus tears derailed his career. I'll tell you about somebody else. and it, it was a knee, at least one, and it may not have been a meniscus, but knee injuries, Bobby Orr, the great Bobby Orr. Now he won twice. And he winds up playing at the end of his career with the Blackhawks. And, but he wa- wasn't the same after those meniscus tears. And you can't say people are going to be these things after. Because they're so yeah. unpredictable, specifically the meniscus but, tear, yeah. which people have come back from. But sometimes you can't come back. And Trout, wow. I, I mean, I just hope he can come back and be some great yeah. semblance. I hope he does hit 70. But, but don't, don't predict it. Don't put this on him. And I bet... He, he, he could come back from that. He, had he could come back from it. It's not a back injury. It's not an arm he injury. He can come back from it. Yeah. I hope he can come back from it. We're going to take a break. We're coming up. What would it mean for Novak Djokovic to beat Carlos Alcaraz with a gold? That would be metal Sunday. And, and what's the word for the numbers that Bobby Witt Jr. has been compiling? Have you ever gone to Jermaine Dye's what? house and asked for a cup of sugar? Paul Canoco, Canoco's mm, house? I could. Or anything? I could. We're How neighbors. about that name dropping? We, we, we discover customers. Frank and I are about to have words. What's first? It would be a blank moment if Novak Djokovic were to beat Carlos Alcaraz in Sunday's Olympic gold medal match. Well, first of all, I think, Frank, we've got the Olympic gold medal final that we want yep. with those two playing. And let's face it, I mean, my word is going to be triumphant because this is a big deal even for Joker, uh, you know, arguably the GOAT, because he's eight weeks after knee surgery, two days after tweaking it, and he'd have to go through Alcaraz, who's beat him in the last two Wimbledon finals and trashed yeah. him at the Wimbledon finals just a couple of weeks ago. So even for Djokovic... He'd have to beat this young and back who seems to now, I know they're even overall like three and three, but let's face it, Alcaraz, I don't know what the betting favorite, I don't really care who the betting favorite is, Alcaraz is on the way up, and Djokovic is sort of, you know, trying to hold his place at the end of his career, relative end, triumphant it would be if he could win. Yeah, and you're right, and doing it at Roland Garros, when you look at the 24 majors that Djokovic has won, he's only won three of them there. On the clay. Mine is good. I agree with you because mine is going to be fulfi- uh, fulfilling because when you think about Djokovic, here's a guy with 24 majors. Getting to 25 is a bigger deal, but he's talked about wanting to win Olympic gold. He carries the flag for yes, Serbia. He if he, and, you know, he, he hasn't won one yet. He even said this season, he said, my priority, my goal this season is to win Olympic gold medal. So here's his opportunity. If he does it against Alcaraz, I think it's going to be really difficult to do for the, uh, you know, the reasons you listed. Got crushed by him at Wimbledon. It's the better surface for Alcaraz. I would think it would be even a bigger deal if it were a year where Djokovic was going, one was winning the Grand Slam and then also got the Olympic. They call it the Golden Slam. Golden which only Slam. Steph- yeah. Steffi Graf's the yeah. only one that's ever Steffi done that, that all the way back in '88. Yep. That's right. All right. What's next? It's blank that Bobby Witt Jr. is the first Major League player in history to go 2020 in his first three seasons. All right, Frank, I'm going to go old man, get off my lawn. It's irrelevant. <laughs> the 20 stolen bases really? particularly are irrelevant. Here's why it's irrelevant. Pete Crow Armstrong, who hasn't even played the whole season with the Cubs, just stole his 21st base this afternoon, 21 for 21. So don't tell me stealing 20 is relevant. Here's what's relevant, and here's what points to Bobby Witt's greatness. He's hitting 350 to lead in all of Major League Baseball. Yeah. Nobody's close to him. He's hit 489 in July. The last two weeks with runners on base, Frank, this is a Little League stat I'm about to give you. He's hitting 778. Come on. That's not even possible. It looks like a mistake. I mean, he is so great, Bobby Witt Jr., but let's not reduce it to, oh, he's 20 for 20 in the last three seasons and he's got 20 home runs. Stop. Let's look at the big picture and the big numbers which underline and underscore his greatness. 
Well, I, then how can your word be irrelevant? It should be valuable as maybe most valuable. Maybe Aaron Judge will get it. Maybe so, uh, Soto, but Witt Jr. will have a chance here. Look at the numbers you just mentioned. You're, you're making, you're dismissing it. It's in the history of baseball, Mike. We're yes. talking 121 years. Mike, everyone else has had a chance to do it. One guy has done it. So it actually means something. And you mentioned the numbers when he's hitting in July. Remember this, too. He finished second in the Home Run Derby. How many times have we heard guys say, oh, you know, it's July. I was participating in Home Run Derby. My bat's slowing Ooh, down. That's why I'm struggling. This guy's actually yeah. elevating his game. And they're also Good. winning. They're Good. 12 games over 500. They've won They're other in a row. measurements. Valuable because it puts them in the MVP race. Yes. They're other measurements. Irrelevant. Not, you know, 2020 because it's three straight years or five straight years or before he turned 21 or which ballpark he did in the shade on a Tuesday. Stop. <laughs> That's the final word. Let's take one last break. We're still to come. Leon Marchand does it again for France. Irrelevant. We're about to go on vacation. That's not irrelevant. And a thrilling finish to the men's 10,000 meters today. Wait till you see this. Mike was all over. That was relevant. Okay? That's relevant. That was good. One of the great sporting events. I mean, the people turn off the damn three-on-three and watch the real (laughs) Olympic competition. They can see stuff that matters. Mike, everything is different at the Olympics. Time to get happy, people. Happy 29th birthday, Kristaps Porzingis. His first season with the Celtics was a huge success. 20 points, seven boards per game, plus a ring for the seven foot three Latvian. He did struggle with injuries again, missing 25 regular season, 12 postseason games, but he played in the clincher against his old team, the Mavericks, and Porzingis is now spending the offseason recovering from surgery he had to address that rare leg injury he suffered during the finals. The Celtics say he might not be back, Frank, until December. Remember, he got hurt in the first round against Miami. He was out almost 40 days. Came back game one of the NBA Finals. Came off the bench, scored 20 points. He was 8 of 13. I covered him his first few years in New York. He's a good guy, but the biggest issue with him is injuries. And look where he is right now. That's a tough one, Frank. It's hard. I hope he gets back out there whenever it is. December, Christmas, New Year's, whatever. Happy anniversary to Jesse Owens. This is posthumous. But on this day, 88 years ago, Owens won gold in the men's 100-meter dash in Berlin. It was one of four gold medals Owens won in those games. The others came in the long jump, the 200-meter, and the 4-by-100-meter relay. All of it came in front of Adolf Hitler, who had wanted to use the games to showcase what he believed to be the racial superiority of white German athletes. But, as Owens said, quote, Although I wasn't invited to shake hands with Hitler, I wasn't invited to the White House to shake hands with the president either." Close quote. While there are a great many athletes who display courage in a million different ways today, none of them should think what they did is greater than what Jesse Owens did that week in Berlin. That is an unbelievable quote. You know, I'm watching the Euro final, Isn't which it? took place in that same stadium. It's hard not to think about Jesse Owens. and Mike. You know, with Simone Biles, which she just did, you start talking about the great American athletes in the summer games, and you have Michael Phelps, Katie Ledecky, Carl Lewis, Simone Biles. You have to put Jesse Owens in there for what he accomplished and when he did it. Yes. Jesse Owens at the top of that for the courage he displayed in defying Adolf Hitler Uh, at the start of World War II. Amazing. Happy trails to the Olympics for the U.S. men's soccer team. The advance out of group play sure didn't last long. Morocco topped the U.S. 4-0 in front of a Persian crowd that heavily favored the nearby African nation. The first goal involved a controversial penalty call that went against the United States, but Morocco's three second-half tallies left no doubt. While the men head home, the U.S. women played their quarterfinal match against Japan at 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. So the tournament started for the men. They lose 3-0 to France. It ends 4-0 to Morocco. And you think about what happened at the Copa America. You wonder where this program is. One thing about this game, you'll like this. Starting in midfield for Morocco, Amir Richardson, the son of former NBA player Michael Ray Richardson. How How cool is that? By the way, I would say no errors, but I said Persian crowd, and I certainly meant Parisian crowd. Parisian. So there was that error today, which we've now corrected. (laughs) We're running out of show. Let's go to the big finish. Leon Marchand of France 
won the 200 meter individual medley for his fourth gold, Frank. That's a big deal, isn't it? Mike, you and I have been to Olympics. When someone from the host nation does this, it is a Goes crazy. huge deal. Big deal. Bravo to him. Xander Shopley, Hideki Matsuyama, and Tommy Fleetwood are tied for the lead after two rounds of Olympic golf. Your thoughts? That's a great leaderboard anytime, anywhere, particularly since John Rahm is only two strokes back. You know, I'm not big on golf in the Olympics, but I want to watch that. Canada beat Spain in Olympic basketball. Is that significant, Frank? Yeah, Canada looks good. And you know what? Greece won today. There's a chance the U.S. could play Greece in the first knockout game. Grant Fisher, I know you're all over this game. The second American man in 56 yes. years to medal in yes. the 10,000 meters today. You were impressed, right? Yes, I am. With all due respect to swimming and gymnastics, the Olympics begin today, the first full day of track and field. Last one, Love Panthers track. backup quarterback Andy Dalton out with a quad injury. You concerned? I mean, that's a couple of weeks. I'm more concerned about Bryce Young, the starting quarterback. That's what I'm concerned about. We're out of time. Thanks for watching. I'm Frank Isola. I'm Mike Wilbon. We're on a two and a half week break, knuckleheads. PTI back Thursday, August 22. And now, your sports. PTI. Stop it. All right, Frank, what did you make of the NFL's new kickoff rule last night? You know, it has potential. I, I tend to lean towards really liking it for a number of reasons. Now, when you first see it, I told you this before, it kind of looked like a new Olympic sport, maybe a combination of NFL football and rugby seven. But I think it's going to accomplish two goals. They want more kickoff returns, which you're going to get. And I think it will cut down on injuries. So it's going to put a little bit more excitement back into the game. No one wants to see the kickers after, you know, to kick off the game or the second half, pounding the ball into the end zone. And, you know, the offense marching onto the field without getting to see a kickoff return. So I think the NFL did a smart thing. I think they were pretty innovative. I think they thought a little outside the box. But also, I know this is going to drive you nuts, I think they kept safety in mind on this one as well. Yeah, I don't think safety is not at top of mind. They do too many other things that counter that. <laughs> but I like you. I le I'm leaning toward liking it, Frank. Yeah. I want to see the kickoff too. You know, I, I, I grew up with Gail Sayers. And then as an old man, had Devin Hester. So to me, Hall of Famer now, Devin yeah. Hester, Hall of Famer, Gail Sayers, the kickoff is just one of the most exciting things in sport. You, you want to return the kickoff alone, you just move the kicker back to the 10-yard line. And that's simple. That's easy. So I don't want to hear about safety. And they do too, do too many other things like adding games that speak to just the opposite. Um, I think they can tweak this. I don't know if they can separate the two sides more. Coaches will be innovators. There'll be people who come up with That's ways right. and personnel to make this work, I think. Like, so, you know, there are plays, Frank, that have gone away from the NFL. First of all, the running back who virtually disappeared in the old form, speaking of Gale Sayers, can you have plays that will work for that play, for this new kickoff? Are, are there sweeps? Are there, are there yeah. maneuvers that will work? Are there strategic uh, structures that you can introduce or bring back? And will the best and brightest do that? I think all that's possible. Therefore, I want it to work, Frank. But again, if you move, it, if you move the kicker back to the 10 and say, let's go, you're going to get more kick returns. And you'd have Devin Hester these days probably having 10 more returns for touchdowns. Yeah, and, you know, Devin Hester said that after the game. He was surprised that there weren't more uh, runbacks. I mean, Devin, congratulations on the Hall of Fame. That's not a Hall of Fame take. It's one game. There are only eight of them in the first preseason game, and no one's going to tip their hand. They're going to wait until the regular season not yet. to put in You're some right. of those plays right. you mentioned. And remember, Absolutely. last year, 73% of all kickoffs were touchbacks. That was the most since 1970. That's when Mike, a young Michael Wilbon, was watching Gale Sayers. Back with the Chicago Bears. That was a long time ago. Great player, though. Gail it's Sayers. been a while. That's it. We're done. Back to you.